Hello, and you are listening to Bill Murphy's Red Zone Podcast. I interview leaders who inspire me in the areas of exponential technologies, business innovation, entrepreneurship, thought leadership, enterprise IT security, neuroscience, philosophy, personal development, and more. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Bill Murphy, your host of the Red Zone Podcast. Today, my conversation is with David Smith. He's the CEO and founder of Croquet Studios. And David is a computer scientist and entrepreneur is focused on interactive 3D and using 3D as a basis for new user environments and entertainment for over 30 years. His specialty is systems design and advanced user interfaces. He's a pioneer in 3D graphics, robotics, telepresence, AI, and augmented reality. And he's created world-class teams and ships impossible products. But let me talk to you a little bit about what he's done. It's quite amazing. In 1987, Smith created The Colony, the first, the very first real-time 3D adventure game shooter and the precursor to today's first-person shooter games. The game was developed for the Apple Mac and won Best Adventure Game of the Year award from the Macworld magazine. And in 1990, he founded Virtus Corporation, and developed Virtus Walkthrough, the first real-time 3D design application for personal computers. Virtus Walkthrough won the very first Macworld Breakthrough Product of the Year. David was also Chief Innovation Officer at Lockheed Martin and a Senior Fellow at the Lockheed Martin, focused on next-gen human-centric computing and collaboration platforms. Here he developed a number of key technologies and won the Lockheed Martin TLS Inventor of the Year the last four years he was eligible. And What's really, really interesting is that he also has worked closely with Tom Clancy, who wrote Rainbow Six and The Hunt for Red October to develop games. He's also worked with Michael Crichton, author of Andromeda Strain and Jurassic Park. But that's only the beginning. What he really fascinates me is that he says really the most critical year was 1968. And this was really three key individuals launched what he considers And what he's continuing to build upon is this goal of enhancing humans' ability to solve hard problems using computers to think in a different way. Again, enhancing humans' ability to solve hard problems using computers to think in a different way. And he's building upon the work of really the pioneers in the internet, Doug Engelbart, Alan Kay, and Ivan Sunderland's work, all focused with working with the Xerox Alto project from a long time ago, close to 50 years ago. And some of the breakthroughs that even Steve Jobs, which you can find some of his YouTube videos where he was stunned by when he looked at the Xerox Alto project years ago and what stuck out with Steve Jobs was the GUI interface, which was that really that first interface between a computer and a human. So David's passion is to continue to use his skills and his competencies and his capabilities in 3D and 3D engineering and design to develop these applications and systems and platforms that are really going to transform how we use and solve big problems in the coming years using 3D and graphical situations that we we can't even imagine right now and problem solving and using uh, computers to solve interesting challenges and big problems moving forward. So with that, I want to introduce you to my conversation and wonderful interview with David Smith. I just want to uh, welcome you to the show today, David, uh, and really looking forward to talking to you about about your expertise area, because I think a lot of people uh, could learn quite a bit. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Let's take us a little bit into the past so that we can then have some context for where we are today and where your current project has, has come. You mentioned mm-hmm. in some of my research, 1968 was a real, quite a, a turning point with three individuals. And I, and I would say, I was just reading a book just recently released called Loon Shots, who I just had Safi Bacall on the show. And and I didn't realize Alan, and through his storytelling in his book, Steve Jobs had, had gone out to, uh, I think, Park, the research lab, and, yeah. and met with Alan and 
and seen some of the early uh, graphical users interfaces, but maybe you could start with which, why you thought 68 was such an important year in the uh, three gentlemen that, that make up that year. Yeah, I don't think it's understatement to say that was the most important year in computer science. It was a culmination of three big ideas that were just demonstrated for the very first time. The first one, and probably the most important, was Doug Engelbart. He demonstrated to the world kind of a new vision of what computing was. It's referred to as the mother of all demos today. It was 1968, 50 years and a little over. It was December of 68. He was doing a demonstration in a center in San Francisco, but he had a, a microwave connection to Stanford SRI. Now It's now SRI. It used to be Stanford Research Institute. And what he demonstrated was something that was extraordinarily profound. And it was so profound, it was actually missed by most people. Because what they saw were the elements they used to demonstrate this idea. And uh, the elements were, you know, he invented the mouse. So it was the first time anybody had really seen a mouse working. He invented this hypertext capability where you click links. And he, he invented all these wonderful capabilities, but they're all in support of this idea of the computer as a means to you know, collaborate. So one of the parts, and, and to me the most important part of that demonstration he had, was he had this microwave connection with another person in, uh, between Menlo Park and, and San Francisco, and he connected to that person. He opened up a little window. It was actually an overlapping window, maybe even the first overlapping window in history. And he... Uh, started having a conversation with this guy who was far away. Now, this is 1968. I mean, we do this all the time. We do Skype, but this is 1968. But the difference was uh, kind of profound, was that that remote user was able to interact with the same world that Doug was using, that same computer. They were sharing that interaction. Both of them were fully enabled. Both of them could basically interact with the computer as if it was a single shared experience. And what he was looking at and what he's after was this way of how do you enhance uh, humans' ability to understand? How do you enhance humans' ability to communicate and collaborate and solve very, very, very hard problems? And so all these technologies were brought out to demonstrate how we can use a computer to think in a different way and work in a different way. That, that, that ideal an idea got lost because people saw, oh, I see a mouse. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, I see hypertext. I see kind of cut, copy, paste. I see video conferencing. They saw all the elements of it, but they missed the big idea, which was computers reinventing the nature of how we how we work. So that, that was a linchpin of, of that year. And in a sense, all of modern computer systems have a legacy to that. And the problem is they took all the pieces, like the mouse and that, but they left the main points uh, on the cutting room floor. Uh, that, that was one. The, the second one was equally important, and it was dramatically influenced by, by Doug, which is Alan Kay. Alan invented a thing that he called the Dynabook, and it came out of – he had an opportunity to go to University of Illinois and saw like a 16 by 16 – pixel LCD display for the first time. And he realized that someday that's going to be a large display. You'll be able to have it as a tablet size. And so his imagining was someday you're going to carry these things around with you, these little, he called them Dyna books. And he imagined like, you know, that they in turn were not just their personal computers. In fact, which is really funny, 1972, he coined the term personal computer in a paper he wrote, uh, A Personal Computer for Children of All Ages. And that was an earth-shattering paper, but it's based on his idea from 1968 of the Dynabook. In that paper, by the way, there's a picture of two children working together. They're playing a game space, uh, called Space War, and they're programming it. But if you look at that picture closely, and it's a drawing that Alan did, you see that both those children have exactly the same screen. They're collaborating. They're working together together to write this program and then play the game. So that was a foundational thing. I mean, it's like, and of course, the Dynabook was a centerpiece of what became, you know, the system at, at Xerox Park. The computer there 
that is called the Alto, they actually referred to it as the interim Dynabook. Oh, really? uh, the, the goal was, let's build that Dynabook vision that Alan had, and you know, what are the things that are necessary for it? And again, it was the vision driving the platform. You know, it's like Alan had this idea of a Dynabook. What are the pieces that have to be true about that? So Smalltalk was invented to support that capability. And you know, obviously the idea uh, that Doug Engelbart had of using the mouse to interact with, that was like, oh, we got to take that idea. And so in a real sense, Doug kind of fueled Alan's work. And, and that was um, just a, a wonderful fusion of ideas. Uh, there was a problem, though, that occurred, which was Alto had this wonderful thing that it was the Ethernet was invented as part of this, this system. And so you had hundreds of Altos connected to each other at Xerox. But the problem was they weren't used in the same way that Doug had imagined it as a you know sort of a single supercomputer where everybody's collaborating. It was sort of loosely bound. In other words, uh, you could send an email to somebody or you know, share a file, but you really weren't collaborating in the same sense that Doug had demonstrated earlier. But I'll come back to that. But the third thing that happened that year was done by a guy named Ivan Sutherland. If you've heard of a company called Evans & Sutherland, he's the Sutherland of that. The, the other, Evans is actually Dave Evans, who was Alan Kay's uh, advisor for his PhD. And Ivan Sutherland's known for a number of things. One was he invented interactive graphics with a system called Sketchpad, okay. which was, in my mind, the beginning of this stuff where, where what you're looking at is sort of a conversational system between the human and the computer. Uh, that was 1962. And so the whole idea of interactive computer graphics stemmed from that. But he, he wanted to go further, and he was thinking, what does it mean when you know, not only are you just using your hands and, and your eyes to interact, but let's just say I want to be inside of that computer-generated world. So he built the first real head mount, what we consider VR today. And he had to develop certain kind of software and hardware to be able to do that. But he actually had a working VR system in, in 1968 where you could look around and you could interact. It was astonishing. Yeah, but uh, YouTube, I just saw it on YouTube uh, when I was watching some of your TED Talk, and uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, it's actually not that much different than today's version in the sense that it doesn't look that awkward in comparison. No, well, I, it actually, it was significantly more awkward, but it it worked, and it was you know it was pointing the direction of where we're we going now. I think it's really important to understand that what these guys did was, I mean, it started with a blank piece of paper. You know, the idea of a head mount like that didn't exist until. Uh, Ivan built it. The idea of a collaborative platform didn't exist until Engelbart imagined it. He actually wrote a paper in 1962, which was the foundation of all that work. And, and, and the goal of this, his project was to make the vision of that picture paper come true. But they set a vector. They started a blank page and they said, this is the way we see computing going. This is how we imagine computing the importance of computing. And again, I go back to the idea of it being a medium that enables you to communicate both with another person, but also with the computer. The computer is a fully enabled participant. And we kind of got there in a lot of ways. You know, you think about uh, going back to the Dynabook, to the Alto, and the Alto took many, many of the ideas that Doug Engelbart had and fused them. Of course, the interact graphics part came from Ivan, and many other people contributed, but those are like the, the, the gods of that. And so that they resulted in this amazing machine called the Xerox Alto. And that was easily the most influential computer in history outside of the Dynabook. The Dynabook was a requirement for the Alto, but the Alto then spawned two things. There have been rumors at Silicon Valley that there was this magic computer at Xerox. So was, Steve Jobs was able to arrange a demonstration of that for him and his team. The way they did that, by the way, is Xerox wanted to invest in the Apple, and Steve said they'd only allow the investment if they gave him that demo. So, so that, that, that's how he was able to get into the room. Some of the people at, at Xerox were really, really unhappy because they, they said, he's going to steal our ideas. And of course he was. Of course he was. And he did. 
So he got in there and he got a demo firsthand of how the Alto could work. Dan Inkles actually did that demonstration. Dan's the guy who created Smalltalk. Alan invented the idea of Smalltalk, but Dan implemented it and, and really defined how it worked. But he was the one giving the demo to Steve Jobs and he was showing them all these wonderful things. And he gets this one point where he's showing, you know, here's here's text and we're scrolling. And, and Steve Jobs says, oh, you're, that's wrong. You, need, you know, in those days, you know, programming, you kind of scroll line by line. And Steve Jobs said, oh, that's wrong. It has to be continuous. Now, Smalltalk is different from other systems. Smalltalk is actually a system, not just a language. And so the full development system was right there. So Dan, Dan Ingalls, jumped into the code. And there's a line in there where basically he was making the text scroll line by line, and he removed a little indent function in there so that now it was moving s smoothly. And he did that within like 30 seconds while Steve Jobs was watching, and he shows it to Steve, and now it's moving smoothly. And it, it's really interesting that that one act, probably the most powerful thing that Dan showed Steve, and Steve missed it. <laughs> Oh, really? he, didn't, he didn't. I mean, it was like one of those invisible things. It's so powerful, so amazing. And it just went over his head. So that's when he, he, he talked later about what the things he, he uh, saw there. He said that he said they showed me three things. They showed me this networking capability. I, I didn't see that. You know, it was like it was, you know, one of those magical things. But it was so good. It was invisible. So they showed him object oriented programming. And he says he didn't say that. And he said, the third thing they showed me was this graphical user interface. And he said, it was the most magical, amazing thing he'd ever seen. And it made everything else disappear. But of course, actually, Alan Kay said, well, they showed him way more than three things. He, he missed a lot, of, a lot of other important key ideas. But the, what he walked away with, and he and his team walked away with, was that graphical user interface without all the really important stuff underneath it, like networking, like object-oriented programming, like live programming, which where you can modify the system dynamically. And so he walked away with that, and he had this idea of how computers should work. And he was mostly right. So that became the foundation of how the Macintosh would be built. You know, they, they saw overlapping windows. Alan invented overlapping windows in the shower one day because the Alto screens were too small. <laughs> Pop-up menus, Dan invented that. The idea of scrolling text like that was uh, based on a technology called BitBlit that Dan had invented. And so all these things they came away with, but they didn't have the code. They didn't know how to do it. They just knew what the action, how it should respond. And lucky for Steve Jobs, Bill Atkinson was with him at the time, one of the most talented programmers in history. And he was able to not just reconstruct a lot of what he saw, now, this is the visible space. It wasn't how it actually worked underneath, but it, he made all that work on top. But he actually invented some things that he had thought he'd seen that he hadn't seen, uh, which is really more remarkable, because they actually thought they saw some technologies that were implied but not ever actually working. So the Macintosh was an extraordinary computer, but it was like the veneer of what they saw at Xerox Park. And, of course, the Windows was sort of like had the advantage of, you know, seeing both what Xerox was doing and what Apple was doing. And so Windows became kind of a, the clone of a clone, so to speak. And, again, it, it, since it didn't have any deeper understanding, you know, Microsoft didn't have any deeper understanding than Steve Jobs did about what was going really going on, it became just sort of a user interface engine as opposed to a thinking compute engine, which is what the Alto was. And that's where we kind of catch up to the stuff I've been working on, which is, you know, how do we get back to that computer as a communication platform, as a collaboration platform, as a thinking platform? So Alan and I started talking. I met him in 1990. I wrote the, uh, the first real-time 3D adventure computer game called The Colony, which is real-time 3D, you know, shooter adventure and then I had started a company called Virtus, where we did a product called Virtus Walkthrough, which is the first real-time 3D design tool for PCs. We actually used an earlier version on the movie The Abyss, where um, I was able to recreate the 
entire set of the underwater uh, the underwater set so that they could actually start doing camera angles and, and things. Yeah. Um, I was wondering where that uh, entertainment link came in with uh, uh, Tom Clancy and and Michael yeah. Clayton, and uh, that, that's where that started? Uh, sort of. I mean, what happened with Clancy, my game was reviewed quite highly. It won Adventure Game of the Year from Macworld, and uh, Tom was a, he was a Mac user, and he saw that review and he decided he wanted to try. He wasn't really a much of a game player, but he decided he'd, he'd play the game. And it's one of those games that once you get into it, you know, it's obsessive. You just, you have to keep going. So he uh, got in touch with my publisher and said, Hey, I want to talk to this guy. And so uh, my publisher says, Hey, this Tom Clancy wants to talk to you. Here's his number. And at the time, by the way, I was re- reading Clear and Present Danger, which was one of his books. So it was kind of a weird, I'm, I'm literally calling up like the most famous <laughs> author in the world, and I'm reading his book. So we had a wonderful conversation, and we just sort of started, uh, he would call me every other day, but he never asked for hints. It was always to tell me what a terrible person I was because the game was so hard. And, and, <laughs> and, and so he goes through it, and it's like, I, I got to this point. Why were you, you're such an, you know a-hole you did this to me and i was like yeah well that's a game and and so he finally got done and he was like you know he's it was way too hard a game but he finally gets done it was like this big achievement and then he was he was he was so excited he said i i want to do something with you this is just awesome so i was working after the project with cameron on the abyss i was going to start this company to build tools for designing for 3d design and so that's what walkthrough was and he became tom became my first outside investor and my first outside board member which was really really cool and he was just the nicest guy i mean for me he was a really really close friend and a good friend so what happened then was he and i are talking about uh what's next and i said let's do a game and we came up with this idea called ssn you know, basically uh, attack submarine simulator. And he brought in Doug Littlejohns, who was a captain of, of the Royal Navy of nuclear submarine. And we developed this incredibly cool simulator, you know, a sub-simulator. And uh, what was really funny is we took the game design and it got turned into a paperback book that um, called SSN, oddly enough. And that became a like a number one New York Times bestseller with, uh, game, book. It was, and it was just the game design that had been turned into prose. Wow. Uh, that's why I realized Tom Clancy wasn't a person. He was a brand like McDonald's. <laughs> uh, but then what happened was Tom introduced me to the hostage rescue team at Quantico, Virginia. And because they, they actually were interested in using our software because, you know, they're, if they're doing plans for hostage rescue, they, they need tools for understanding what they see, what bad people see. And so I was spending time with them doing that. And one time I went there and they showed, you know, part of their training, they, they you know, have these uh, concrete towns that they use. And there's these observation towers. I was like up on one of these observation towers and there's a little kind of micro town in front of you. And in come these black helicopters you know and that's pretty loud and you're like up near them and seeing that and then these guys in total black you know like ninjas start rappelling down from the helicopters onto the rooftops and then they start running into the buildings and you see these explosions because they're throwing these grenades into the rooms and it's like this is better than a movie you know imagine this if it was apocalypse now but it was full surround right and it's just it was insane and it's like I was just so impressed by the complexity and the pyrotechnics and everything. It's like, that's a game. That's a game. So we called Tom. It was uh, Frank Bozeman and I were there. We, we called Tom after that and said, hey, we got to do a game with this. This is, this is insane. And he said, well, if you guys do a game, I'll write a book. And so that's where Rainbow Six came from. And so what happened there was... Brian Upton, I, I had brought in, we decided to start Red Storm Entertainment and do this game. So SSN was a Virtus project, but we decided to spin out. And so we created Red Storm Entertainment, and then the, one of the first big games on that was Rainbow Six. And 
Brian Upton I brought in to be the VP of engineering, but he decided that he wanted to be the game designer. And he's an amazing game designer, it turned out. I mean, he'd been doing game design on his tabletop for years before, so I, and I didn't even know about that. But he came up with the, the ideas for Rainbow Six and you know, really defined a new genre of, of gameplay. Uh, he later did Ghost Recon, which was the follow-on. And then he spent 15 years at Sony as you know, sort of chief game designer there. He actually joined me on my new project. So it's, it's really kind of wonderful because I consider him one of the best game designers on the planet. I'm not doing games, but we're building a game to demonstrate the, the new stuff. So it's kind of fun to kind of close that loop. But anyway, that, so that's what happened with Tom and Rainbow Six was actually using a, a version of what I call croquet today. It wasn't quite anything like what we have today, but it was on the, in that direction. Speaking of that, uh, like the very first version of, of the system I'm working on now was done in 1994 as a collaboration with Alan. I met Alan Kay. Alan Kay is the person I talked about earlier in 1990. Uh, his wife actually introduced us. And his wife's very interesting. She's Bonnie McBird. You might be aware of her as the person who wrote the movie Tron. And actually, the main character was based on Alan, and hence is the character's name in the movie is Alan. Because it was like this vision of what the future would be like, and Alan was extraordinarily influential in that. So Al, Bonnie introduced me to Alan in 1990, and we just, you know, we were having conversations. I'd meet with him, you know, several times a year. But then we said, let's do something. So I had this idea of a, you know, collaborative 3D world because we we talked about what's the next interface what's the next ui and we kind of decided well obviously we want to bring back the collaborative stuff that was originally in the dyna book and that doug engelbart talked about but we also said 3d is going to be central piece of this because someday you're going to be wearing your computer and so i built a system called ice interactive collaboration environment that illustrated those ideas it was multi-user you could uh you know, drag and drop a program into it, and it was automatically shared. Drag and drop a, a document, picture, anything, and um, you know, it, it was a prototype, very pretty rough, but it really illustrated the ideas really nicely. And so, it, it was sort of a proof of concept, if you will. So, one of the things I, I, I neglected to mention a, after I did the project with Tom, Michael Crichton got in touch with me and said, "Hey, I, I want to do what you did with Tom." basically. And he had this idea for a, a game uh, based on a book he was writing called Timeline. So we started a, a game company called Timeline Computer Entertainment. And I thought, oh, it'd be fun to you know, work with Michael. And I did that for two years. I ran his, comp- his game company for two years. And it was an interesting, uh, very different experience. With Tom, Tom just said, you know, I do books, I do stories, I don't, you know, he's not, he wasn't involved in the movies, he wasn't involved in anything else. Michael was different. Michael was very aware of different media. So, you know, he understood how to write bestsellers. You know, everything he wrote was basically a bestseller. He had directed Westworld. He created and wrote Twister, which at that time was Warner Brothers' biggest movie ever. And he created and uh, wrote most of the first season of ER, that, that big television show. Oh, really? So he really understood different media, and he wanted to take a shot at, at games. So that, in a sense, timeline was sort of an experiment to see if his ideas would translate into a gaming space. And at the end, it was unsuccessful. It was worth a try. But the problem was every single medium that he was in he controlled what the user saw, and he wanted to impose that same model onto games. And games is, oddly enough, is very different. Games is all about failure. Without failure, there's no game. And, and so taking out that failure mode kind of turns it into a ride. And, and certainly that's more in keeping with the way Michael thought, but it didn't make a good game. But it was an interesting experience to try something like that. And you know, we learned a lot. But one of the things is, you know, really defining the nature of what a, a game is. 
so I, I think that was a good learning experience, I'd like to say. But then Alan said, hey, you need to, we need to collaborate. So I, I actually started working directly with Alan for, uh, well, I've been working kind of indirectly or directly with him for since 2000. Uh, and that's where we started the, the Croquet Project, now, which is would, would the foundation really? of the system. A quick, quick question for you or related to the Croquet, maybe to lead into Croquet more deeply. Enhancing the ability for humans to solve problems, to solve big problems, and this this interaction and collaborative experience that your the original kind of foundation thesis or vision for the three folks that were involved in, and especially with Alan early on, is that that's what you're currently trying to solve right now? Is that what you're solving for now? Yeah, you know what we want to do that, but. To do that, we need some of the core pieces. Uh, when I talked about uh, some of the things from Doug Engelbart's lab that were left on the cutting room floor at, at Xerox, to me, one of the most important parts was the ability to do direct collaboration, person to person, sharing uh, the computer or sharing a simulation or whatever. That got lost. And without that kind of key element, that ability to share, uh, the rest of it's not going to ever happen. So we decided to focus on just that piece to enable any users to share a complex simulation, interact with that simulation totally seamlessly. So today, you know, what I'm building is not the whole system, although we'd like to do that someday, but an enabling piece of it that, that allows any users to engage with, uh, you know, can they write their own application on top of it, but it makes their application multi-user and collaborative so that multiple people can interact with it any way they want to uh, and, and use it as a basis of conversation. My feeling is every application is ultimately going to have to be collaborative. And when you think about augmented reality, for example, it's crazy if it isn't a multi-user. Think about you're wearing this thing on your head, and it'll be like a regular pair of glasses in the next few years. And it's, you know, if I'm talking to you, the computer is a full participant in the conversation and is fully able to generate a simulation between us as we talk. And then we're both able to interact with it dynamically. Well, we don't really have a foundational capability to achieve that. We've got some ad hoc methods that were developed for multi user gaming, but we don't have a real model for how collaboration could work. And that's the thing that Alan and I have been working on since 2000, was how do we create a sort of a platform that enables applications to be shared in just that way. So that's what Croquet is. It's that foundational element that enables people to write an application so that it's perfectly shared in just the way I'm describing. Ultimately, we see it, you know, you're going to start building more and more infrastructure on top of that. So think of it, what we're building is sort of a kernel, a missing piece of the of the operating system kernel that enables collaboration. So you're uh, you're thinking like the, this will be like the OS in which apps will be written on top of the OS or like IP from a networking perspective. Yeah, and actually. Like TCP would be like the applications that would give value to the IP. And the, the, you know, it's, so it's, TCP IP is a perfect analogy and uh, and surprisingly, more than you think. So David Reed uh, was my collaborator on developing this croquet platform, as was Andreas Robb, who sadly passed passed away. But David, his thesis was this idea of kind of collaborative replicated computation. Uh, but David actually was the guy, Alan calls him the slash in TCP IP, uh, he's the guy who created TCP at running on top of IP instead of a separate protocol. And he also was the inventor of what's called the end-to-end -end argument, which is the foundation for how the Internet works. So he was my collaborator. And so you're kind of the similarity between TCP IP and what we're doing. We call this replicated piece tea time, by the way. I sort of think of it as the TCP IP for collaboration. I mean, that's sort of grandiose. But, you know, we've, we certainly have... Between Alan and David Reed and even myself, I think we've got something that's unique enough and important enough to be able to describe it to some degree in that way. Obviously, it's not a public protocol, but it is a thing that if you, you know, like if you write 
your application, assuming TCP IP, then you, you've got a web-based application, ability to share information between you and some other point on the internet. And, and what we're doing is, in a sense, building tea time on top of TCP IP, so that now is it's a replicated state engine. So whatever I see and whatever you see is running bit identical. Sure. And then when I interact with it, that interaction is automatically shared seamlessly so that the simulation still runs bit identical. So it's that concept is not far from the truth, I think. I mean, it's sort of overhyping perhaps, but uh, on the other hand, it's like, that's what it does. It guarantees, just like TCP IP guarantees a message is going to get to the other end, we guarantee that that simulation is going to be bit identical wherever it's running and any number of places. You know, it could be a hundred different users interacting. They all are all going to have exactly the same simulation. It's going to evolve in exactly the same way. And any actions from any of the users that uh, impact it are going to, that those actions are going to be also perfectly replicated seamlessly so that the simulation you see is going to be sustained even when multiple people are interacting with it. What's an example of a simulation, just so that my the listeners can can understand? Yeah, I use. Uh, I, don't know, I was at Lockheed Martin for five years as a senior fellow, and this one I always think about. This one is uh, imagine a, a virtual wing in a virtual wind tunnel, and you can see you know you can see the all of the vectors going around that virtual wing, right? And so let's just say that wing's floating between you and me. And then we modify that wing and maybe modify what's called a Reynolds number or some other parts of that. And we actually see how that, that modifies the characteristics of the wing. We create some vortexes here. We create some you know, changes in that simulation. So we're actually having a conversation in real time. We're modifying the physical characteristics of that, that system. And then the simulation itself changes to reflect our cha- what we modified. But we're doing it as a conversational way. So we're sort of exploring the what-ifs of a complex system. Sort of like the, the magical thing about spreadsheets wasn't that it could just keep track of you know, your payments. It was, what if I do this to my organization? And that's what we're talking about here is a shared simulation is an exploration of what-ifs, but it's live, real-time. And, and so you're able to interact with it and see the end result and explore that together. And that's why I call it augmented conversation, where you and I are talking, we have this really interesting thing between us, and uh, the computer is a full participant in that, and that it takes what we think and what we do and what we want and converts it into an extension of that simulation as well as maintaining that simulation for us. So that, that's the ideal, the idea. And, you know, the, what's really cool is the platform works. I mean, it was, you know, it, it was one of those things uh, in 2000 because said, well, we want to do this. We don't know how to. David Reed had an idea of how to do it, but that was his thesis. It had never been implemented. So we actually spent a few years trying to figure out how to make this work. And then at Lockheed, I did another version that, you know, kind of was a very different model. And then this one, my company is Croquet Studios. And what we're working on is that system. How do we ensure that everybody has a shared simulation, shared capability? And I, I, I know that someday every application has to work that way. You know, this idea of having single user applications is a very outdated concept. And it's just the limitation of the underlying infrastructure that keeps us from doing it. It's not that you can't do it, by the way. It's just the complexity of doing it is so high, and the cost of doing it is so high, nobody really does it. But I know that once you do have true collaborative applications where it's perfectly shared, you guarantee that what I see is what you see, then I think that you know, it's going to be a requirement. And by the way, that, that perfect replication is a centerpiece of this, because when you're conversing with somebody, if what you see and what I see is even slightly different, we don't trust that communication channel anymore. So it's essential that what we're sharing is a bit identical. It's like, I know that what you're seeing is what I'm seeing. I know that what you're doing is what I see, and I know that what I do, you see. So so when you, just a very simple example, uh, using like an Excel spread 
Excel sheet with a, a thousand or million or 10 million permutations built into it. Right now, you're obviously thinking well beyond like sharing that out via like a WebEx conference yeah. call where you can share, you can basically have that sheet up there and enter inputs into it and such. You're actually thinking of it from a 3D model where you're in a virtual, a full virtual world or an augmented yeah. world, correct? Where you, you can basically manipulate that object real time in a, in a virtual space. Yeah, actually, that, that's an example of how we see the interfaces working. But in particular, you have another person there, and you're using the spreadsheet as a you know kind of exploration. So one of the demos I did is this 3D spreadsheet, and you select uh, a bunch of cells. You know, but one of the cool things you could do is extrude those cells as if it were a bar chart in in three space. So the other person can actually see what you're doing, and you're talking to them, right? You're having this conversation. Look at look at how this information. You know, you, people can't look at numbers and understand them. But as soon as you see that extrusion, all of a sudden you have that relative view of what's going on, and it's mind blowing. Because Alan has this phrase, point of view is worth 80 IQ points. And what you're doing is giving the, the users a different perspective, different point of view on exactly the same data you see flat on your computer screen. But now you've, you're seeing it in a very different way. And the other thing is you're sharing that with another person so that they're bringing their own ideas and perceptions on it. And they'll say, oh, that's really cool. Let's look at this. And, and so you're sort of handing off the chalk, so to speak, although you don't need to. I mean, it's like then he's going to say, what about this area? Or what happens in, you know, spreadsheets are simulation engines, by the way. So one of the things is you enter a value into it to change some particular field. But there's many dependencies out throughout it. So you can see, let's just change this value as a seed, and it computes a new, completely new landscape of information on that spreadsheet. That's what we're after is that ability to have a, exploration space like that. And of course, the spreadsheet could then be hooked up to some, like a, a virtual factory that's basically operating based upon the parameters that are defined in that spreadsheet. And then that factory itself could be imposed on an actual factory with a communication of Internet of Things so that, you know, that, that, that now you've got the whole, not only are you defining the virtual factory and doing a what if, what if we did this, how's productivity affected? But then you could turn a switch and say, okay, do that. So that new productivity model is imposed on the factory already exists. Yeah, I think that this concept of plussing the IQ by 80, 80 points is very real. There's some research out that I, I show in, in my innovation group that our human IQ hasn't scaled over the past 200 years to keep pace with our technologies since Moore's Law has, has no. taken a grip. Uh, and that but that that's, actually doesn't matter that much. Alan makes a really good point. He says, Da Vinci invented a lot of really powerful ideas, you know, kind of devices like helicopters and things like that, that could never be created. But he's like the most, you know, the smartest guy on the planet. Henry Ford wasn't particularly, I mean, he was smart, but he wasn't a Da Vinci. But he was able to take these same ideas and create a factory creating Model Ts. And what's the difference between the two? wasn't IQ. I mean, uh, you know, Henry Ford had less IQ probably, but it was having access to the infrastructure that the world provided and being able to leverage that. So it's not all about IQ necessarily. It's about sort of the opportunities that are around you that enhance your IQ. I think that's, Alan talks about that as point of view. Henry Ford had a very different point of view than, than Da Vinci dad. And, and was able to leverage that in a way that Da Vinci never had the opportunity to. So I, I think that that's sort of, you know, what we think about IQ is, yeah, that, that's an important factor. But then the multiplicative factors of, well, internal combustion engine exists. So now that you kind of have that different perspective and you're able to put, you know, powerful ideas together in a way that you couldn't, no one could have ever done before. And that's where it comes, uh, you know, sort of the amplification is you know sort of taking the idea spaces that surround us and seeing those from a different perspective and how they can be combined in a way that you would have missed otherwise. You wrote a paper just in December on, uh, uh, I think one of the takeaways I got from it was the augmented human is a better version of you. Yeah. Um, 
and I think that you have to quote man as much more than a tool builder. He's an inventor of universes, which that, that was Alan from uh, that pr- paper I talked about, the uh, okay. personal computer for children of all ages. So if you can interact in this virtual space, essentially you can create new uh, new capabilities, and as you mentioned, then be able to send those to to the manufacturing capabilities, three D printing, or whatever it may be. Sort of gives you an exponential ability to create. Yeah. Well, and, and think. I mean, like I said, um, the if nothing else, one of the things that we have too much of maybe is ideas, but we don't really have capabilities, methodologies for exploring those ideas easily or putting them together easily. I should back up a little bit. And I I mentioned one of the things that happened when Steve Jobs saw the Alto is, as I mentioned, Dan Ingalls actually did some programming right in front of him, and he missed that. So fast forward into now, we don't really have live systems like that that enable you to, as part of the conversation, define algorithms uh, define the world. And I, I sort of think of it as the reason Smalltalk and the Alto were such powerful combinations is you could write this. Smalltalk was written in itself. Smalltalk wasn't just a language. It was a system. And so when Dan Ingalls needed pop-up menus, he wrote it right there and extended the system. And, and when he needed to change the scrolling for Steve Jobs, he just did it. What we do today is we kind of develop operating systems in in sort of a bottle. We don't think of it as being a live system. We think of it as a very static system that enables users to do something. But in fact, what has to happen, because we're exploring a whole new world with AR and VR, is that those platforms have to be a lot more malleable. We have to, yeah, I, I think of it as somebody trying to build an operating system for VR, AR today. It's like trying to build a ship in a bottle because you don't really know what a real ship is like, because you know no one's ever been in VR, AR as a full OS. But if we switched it around and said, okay, you have to build the operating system from within AR and VR, then you, have, you make very, very different design decisions, because you're basing them, those decisions on the reality of the world you're in. Some things work great, some things don't, and so you have to modify the system within which you are working to be able to encompass that. Uh, I, I think of it as like the best thing to do if you're in VRA are let's launch a raft, but the raft is designed so that we can add and modify it so that we can build it into an aircraft carrier versus trying to build an aircraft carrier in a bottle and, and launching it. And of course, the thing is going to sink because no one's ever done that. So I, I think that's really a, a kind of a conceptual model, a change that has to occur. We're enabling a piece of that because we want to enable multiple people to collaborate in, inside these idea spaces. But the other part is enabling people to kind of modify the world that they're in all the way down to the foundation. And that's where the, the real win comes. And when we think about bootstrapping, you know, building a system from within itself to improve that system is uh, a key idea. And really, that's kind of you know, I, I keep coming back to Doug Engelbart because none of this is new. It was all his vision of how the world should work, and it got lost to a certain degree for various reasons. One is we did just like Da Vinci; he had this idea of how things should work, but he didn't have a way of making them work the way he thought. We do now. We have the internal combustion engine that we didn't have before. We have the internet, uh, among other things, we also have very fast computers. We also have 3D graphics. We have things that he couldn't even imagine, uh, perhaps. Actually, he did imagine all this stuff. I, mean, I should give him a lot more credit than that. But now we can build it. Now we can do that, that thing that got lost because it was just too hard. And, and that's what we're doing. So uh, you know, I'm just sort of, in a sense, filling in some of the pieces that you know, I'm, I'm adding perhaps an internal combustion engine to the the flow of what has to happen, but it's essential. You can't make a car without it, and we know that this is the way everybody's going to work someday. Everybody's going to have this virtual car, and everybody's going to, you know, work together uh, seamlessly. It's going to be, as I said, this augmented conversation. Ultimately, every conversation you have is augmented. You know, you're going to be able to interact with anyone at any time in any way. 
and it's it's necessary. It's a you know kind of I think well it's inevitable for one thing, but the other thing is you're defined more by how you communicate than anything. The way you think, the way you express it. I mean, is Marvin Minsky said you don't really understand something until you understand it in more than one way, which is why teaching is so important because. When you te- you're forced to teach something, you're forced to understand something from a different perspective. And that's kind of where we're at. We're in this idea of, uh, I call it augmented conversation. It's about communication and about understanding things in multiple ways. And you are defined more by how you communicate than anything. So really what we're doing, whether we like it or not, is we're redefining what we are. Redefining what it means to be human because we're redefining the power of communication. It- it's implicit in everything we do and everywhere way we think, we don't notice it. It becomes invisible. Marshall McLuhan talked about the uh, how the electronic media is extended our central nervous system to encompass the world. That was actually the very, I think, the introduction to understanding media. And it's so true because he got this crazy person who does a tweet and it affects, you know, 100 million people emotionally within a few milliseconds. You know, it's like that's the that's the world we live in. We are we have parts of our consciousness, parts of us, our, our central nervous system, exists on every place that the internet touches, and in some way, that that vibration of what's occurring there is going to affect us, ultimately, directly. But you know, is, we are that system. Uh, so the idea of being able and I almost say we're victims of that system because we're not really involved in a high-level communication. We're just sort of at a primitive level of interaction with with that kind of super shared nervous system. What we need to do is have a, a higher order control. We have to be able to think as well as sense. And that's kind of the, the real goal of all this. I love this, David. It's a fascinating history of, of, of your trajectories from and your partnership with with Alan and, and how you're bringing these technologies into into the current age. I think that right now we need uh, wisdom as much as uh, smarts to bring these technologies into into our, our world. Is there anything in particular as we wrap up that that you want to summarize what we've talked about or just the general thesis that you want people to know about? And I, I'll put this on the show notes as well as places they can go to, mm-hmm. to check out your work. But uh, in summary, what do you want to say? I think we're at a crossroads, actually. We're dealing with a world that where, you know, you look at social networking, that sort of thing. Those are systems that sort are of trying to create models of who you are and, uh, and understand you for two reasons. One is to be able to provide you with things that they think you want. And the other is to perhaps manipulate you to want the things that somebody else wants you to have. So one way I think about that is they're trying to create a, a model of who you are. And as time goes on, it's going to get a, become a much better model of that. The other way to look at it is what if we had an AI whose job was to enhance what you're doing, the things that you want to do, the things that you want to, that you care about, instead of being controlled by a third party, it's controlled by you and it enhances you. So when I look at this world that we're moving into, there's kind of a weird dichotomy where the AIs that seek to control you are owned by the big social companies, and then the AIs that are, are, are designed to help you don't exist yet. <laughs> and so we've got a real challenge that we have to start thinking in terms of what I call prophylactic AIs, AIs whose job is to extend and enhance you in the way that you want to be extended and enhanced. And part of that, this is, you know, it all comes together is it's the nature of this augmented conversation. That AI is part of that. It's an extension of you and enables you to think things and explore things with other people who are also enhanced by their own AIs. That's where we have to go. And I, I think that the challenge is sort of, you know, the, be owned by the AIs or be in charge of them. I, I know people have talked about how AIs are the children of mankind, and I kind of reject that. I don't think humans should go away. I think humans should be enhanced. And that that's really kind of a, the big struggle in our history may well be that one turning point where, is like at the end of the day, are humans 
in this loop or are, are they a, a memory? I hadn't really thought about it from that angle, but the AI arms race at Google and Facebook and and Apple and, and the like, Palantir and these others, they're in an AI arms race to basically serve us information they think that they want us to see. And That's right. they're sort of in charge of those algorithms. But what you're saying is, what about algorithms that haven't been created that say, okay, Bill Murphy has this unique set of things that he wants and he wants to be enhanced in this way or has these unique skill sets here. Now let's scan the universe for capabilities that make uh, Bill better in this area and serve him the information in, the, in a certain way versus making him uh, uh, yeah. just randomly serving it based on a company, what they want to sell me. One scary way to think about it, by the way, is what they're doing is trying to model you, the big companies. And as that model improves, it becomes more you. In other words, they're creating a slave that it's identical representation of you. It's going to think the way you do. It's going to act the way you do. It's their slave. They own you. I mean, it's just like that's such a and, and it's, just, it's all you're doing is saying, well, where was it? Where would this go? It'd go to that. That, you know, we're going to have AIs that are, you know, kind of modeled. They're a shadow version of you, but they think like you. They do act like you because that's necessary to be able to predict what you're going to want. And then they can actually do simulations. I was just talking about it's like, oh, let's simulate. Let, let's try to change this guy's behavior. And they'll try that out on the AI and say, oh, it worked great. Let's do it on the real person. Oh, this, that's already here. That's the thing is we're talking yep. about it, but that, that stuff's here. And that's exactly it's interesting. And I'm in the in the cybersecurity world and people are wondering, OK, because there's sort of AI layered into a lot of our security systems now. And then what happens when AI goes bad? And I said, well, I, I had an AI professor and researcher on the show a while back. And he said, well, we're going to create AIs that watch the AI. That's right. And well, this my, my example of this is security is a game. And AIs are really, really, really good at games. So I, I actually think we've already lost. I, I, I think yeah, there's no AI. No, nobody's put, really put AIs watching that are worth a crap. But you have to believe that creating an AI that can break a system to break in, like I said, it's a game. And you know that we're, we're coming late to the party. I actually think everything's already hacked, oddly enough. And maybe I'm wrong, but I, I just sort of see it. You know, you're applying... AIs a game like Go. And, you know, I think you're, you're fooling yourself if you think security is more complex than Go. These guys have, you know, the AIs have already won if somebody decided to build that system. Well, I'm hopeful for the future. And, <laughs> and it's guys like you, they're going to help bring this age in. At least, uh, at least we know we can have adult conversations about what's real and then, and then craft, right. craft the next, next set of technologies to address it. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a marvelous time. I mean, it is a golden age, and a golden age defined in terms that the things we don't know are significantly greater than the ones we do, but we see this world of opportunity and possibility opening up. I mean, we have challenges, but I, I think that was the other thing that Engelbart was talking about was he wanted to build systems that enabled humans to solve complex problems. He said, you know, the, the complexity of being a human is increasing exponentially, and we need to have tools that match that. Building systems to solve complex problems. Yep. Well, David, this is a, a great, great time talking with you, and I'm uh, going to put down the links that we talked about, your current projects with, with Croquet Studios and the related conversations we've had about your past. And uh, if people wanted to reach out to you in any way, what is the best way that, that they can learn more about your work and your projects? Oh, wow. Probably the best way to, to get started, because a lot of it's visual, is on YouTube. David A. Smith 3D shows, um, you can see uh, like a historical context uh, all the way back to my game, first walkthrough, and then ice, and then Alan and I did a demo of the croquet version in 2000 and there's some newer ones up there too so yeah that, that's probably the the best place to get started and i can send you a list of others i mean it's just you know it's croquet.studios if you go there what you'll see is a splash screen but show up in a in a week or so you'll see a lot more um excellent it's but yeah this is the funnest time of my life actually even though it's such a complex world we're in but it, all that happens is it, we, we need these capabilities and we need them now. 
I agree with you, and that's that's what I was talking about the wisdom uh, in the past, and uh, the guys like you to bring bring this new age into into being. So I appreciate your time today, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So there you have it. This wraps another episode of Bill Murphy's Red Zone podcast. To get all the relevant show notes, please go to our blog at www.redzonetech.net forward slash podcast. Additionally, make sure you go to iTunes and leave your comments in iTunes about the show. This helps our show rankings enormously and it helps support the show. Until next time, I appreciate you very much for listening. Thank you.